Let's say, Don, is usually a good soul. Oh, it works. Shocking that it works. <laughs> How long it's going to last, but. Being all right. Uh, welcome to the ordinance committee meeting of Thursday, September 16th, 2021. Um, what we will do is start with a call to order, please, Tracy. Here. And then uh, could we have approval of the minutes from August 19th? So we'll second. And um, we'll take a vote on that. Council Johnson? Yes. Council Hamill? Yes. Council Katarina? Yes. And then I have a request for an addition to the agenda. To the agenda. Yes, Madam Chair, thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, with your uh, flexibility and grace. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. I want to make a, an adjustment to the agenda, agenda this evening and make a, add a, a topic for, for discussion. Um, and this has to do with uh, um, kiteboarding activity and related concerns. You know, I have okay. a, a statement and an update that I'd like to share, but I want to make sure we get that on the agenda before we run out of time. Thank you. All right. Would you like to do that right now? I would. If you yeah. Would. If we could, we, why don't we do it before we do public comment? Thank you. It's short and sweet. Um, we're well familiar with the issue of competing demands on our natural resources in Scarborough, and this has been addressed in our comprehensive plan, and will be a continuing theme for our beaches and beach communities, parks, and open spaces. There's there's been an increase in kiteboarding activity this summer. Last Wednesday evening, I counted 13 kite boarders you know, on the beach in front of the park. Uh, fortunately, we're at the tail end of the season, so there were, you know, there weren't not many people on the beach, you know. But I discussed this several times in our leadership meetings, most recently, late yesterday, with Town Manager Tom Hall prior to our council meeting. It, it's been a topic of conversation and a series of communications with resident Dan Warren, who initiated this matter. Uh, this past summer and who continues to raise public safety concerns. These concerns or incidents have not been registered so far, however, by any others with either public safety or the marine resource officers. They involve alleged incidents of risks to swimmers and beachgoers when kite boards are being launched, flown, and landed, primarily in the Hurt Park area of Pine Point Beach. I had a preliminary conversation with a representative from the Surfrider Foundation yesterday to learn more from experts and enthusiasts about this issue. There is a website called mainkite.com, which is a guide to kiteboarding spots in Maine, which lists Pine Point Beach and Ferry Beaches as featured kiteboarding beaches. And you should have a look at it. It's really pretty What's important. The mainkite.com. They have a, a very impressive focus on safety and training. So one, one thing's clear, uh, this issue will not go away. I'm interested in erring on the side of safety and getting out in front of the matter. At the same time, we need to be respectful of various activities of beachgoers, sunbathers, sandcastle builders, sports activists. So I'd like to know the opinion of my colleagues on the ordinance committee about this and defer to them on the matter. Would a workshop in this matter make sense? Uh, Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Why you start again? No, no. You're, you're fine. You're again. No. <laughs> uh, and, and to see if there's sufficient interest to, start to begin a discussion that could move forward with other steps, perhaps with a town council action item or a small ad hoc committee for the off season, or simply table it at, for a later date based on public input and support. But I felt it necessary that we get this on the record. I'm tired, tired of going back and forth. Uh, on an issue in a very negative vein. And I think that this was, was worthy of discussion uh, at the ordinance meeting. Thank okay, you. thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, do you have any uh, thoughts? I'm gonna review the mainkite.com and uh, I definitely have witnessed it. And I, mean, I think it's quite awesome to watch because what I do is immediately see the possibility of Risk. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what can be done about it. So, I think we could explore it a little bit more. I don't know if it's seasonally 
driven. You know, people don't go in the water after September, right? You know, could be a lot of different ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think it's worth an exploration. Okay. I know my thought on it is it's interesting that we haven't had any public safety or marine officer complaints or whatnot. As people know, I walk frequently on Ferry Beach. Um, and they are there all winter. I love them in the water in the middle of winter. Kite surfing. Uh, I know we do have something about kite surfing under the plover mm -hmm. ordinance. Um, and I've got the details of that. I want to say it's 600. 650. 650. I was close. Um, but I would say this isn't anything that needs any immediate attention. Um, Perhaps we can look at it, you know, as we get closer to the, the season. But I need to do more research on it too. Because okay. I personally, I've never seen anyone out of control or not doing the right thing. Sure. But uh, again, I'm only sick right. from Ferry Beach, not Pine Point. There's a question out of the chair. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned kites under the pole, but where would that be? Because again, I would like to go to the that situation that they use. Chapter, chapter 610. Oh, it's actually the floor. Yeah, it's it the is. Floor yep. floor. And it's in section four, subsection five. Thank you. And I know when we passed that, there was some consternation amongst those who do kite surfing when we did the floor thing. But you know, since then. And the only other thing I'd say is yeah. I, I, I understand and agree with what you say, but without some type of date certain to maybe come back and review this, it might get lost as we go. It's so this is so is there any way to maybe March first? Yeah, put some kind of and again after an election you don't know right. what may change. Right. I would say March, whenever the ordinance meeting is in March. Okay, we'll be chair board, so we'll right. I would say that would give enough time. I would think. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Begin with that. Okay, I'm watching that. We yeah. capture that in a minute, and uh, yeah. somehow that gets tickled up on an agenda. Time. Right. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? So, so the consensus is for us to revisit at a later date, you know, later than March, but to try to study it further. Sure, yes. and, you know, yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll be hearing from from either party or both. Uh, uh, sides of the issue. I suggest yeah. maybe you and I uh, take a road trip out to Hawaii or something. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> See what they do. Over there. <laughs> I'm a friend there right now with Maui. I'm not signing up for Kaipo. <laughs> so, but thank you. All I, right. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. All right. Um, uh, do we have any public? We, we have one member of the public. Thanks. All right. Um, we do have uh, time for public comment right now. Does anyone? Yes. Allison has her hand up, yep. so go ahead, Ms. Bristol. Can you hear me? I see. I see. I see Don nodding his head. Thank you very much. Uh, nice to see everybody. Allison Bristol, Six Bayview Avenue, and I was just uh, calling in on the, um, you know, revamp of the um, 5G ordinance. And I know it's been a long time since we've, uh, since this has been under discussion. And I, a uh, couple of things I wanted to share. I read through the um, draft that was posted with the agenda and really what popped off the page with, with for me was, and I know that there were comments from um, Mr. Cohen and and uh, representing, I think, a coalition of wireless providers. But what kind of popped off the page to me in rereading this was how the ordinance seems to be formulated by the industry. And so I'm just calling in to encourage and ask the counselors to please also consider the concerns that many people of the public have expressed um, and just to rattle a few of those off, protecting the visual character and ecological sensitive and scenic resources, historic properties and landmarks, maintaining aesthetics consistent with neighborhood characteristics, established distance from residential structures and separation from existing small wireless facilities, 
establish height limitations for co-location and new uh, small wireless facility structures, establish maximum noise emission and a butter notification. And um, one thing I wanted to also add, uh, something that's near and dear to my heart is protecting the uh, th ecologically sensitive areas and scenic vistas. There is, and um, I can, you correct me if I'm wrong, and I know I got off track at one point and shared some great language from Lewiston, which turned out to be from Lewiston, New York. But um, Lewiston, Maine, from what I can find online, does have uh, an ordinance. It's chapter 71 and in article two, which I believe was adopted in February of 20, of 20 uh, that article includes to protect the scenic and visual character of the community in its purpose and, and under standards of review states that proposed small cell facilities will have no unreasonable adverse impact upon designated scenic resources within the municipality. So from what I can discern, there is a precedent already set for this in the state of Maine. And I certainly hope that the committee and the council will figure out a way to incorporate this in, into whatever 5G ordinance we come up with. So I thank you all very much for your time and always for your service. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, is uh, there Chair, any... Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Allison. Uh, what was that ordinance in Allison? It's Lewis and Maine. Yeah. I, and I, I, I know which ordinance okay. you're talking about. Right? Chapter 71, yeah. Article 2 is what you referenced. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Seeing no other hands raised or members of the public, we will move on. Um, the first thing we need to do is take up our remote meeting policy since we are showing on the last page that wasn't done that. Uh, Liam, do you mind yeah. reminding us about this? Sure. So, um, if you recall, there was a, a, a change through state statute which uh, allowed for uh, remote participation of elected bodies uh, in the course of their committee work and carrying out their duties for under certain circumstances. Um, this is obviously a change where uh, all previously all committee and, and elected bodies had to be actually present to, to vote and participate. Uh, so through that change, uh, there is an obligation for every individual committee to adopt a policy unique to their to their committee, and that's the, the exercise we're going through right now. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from members of the ordinance committee? I know you guys have seen this in other committees. I've seen it a few times. I have no questions. John? No, mine is mainly a question on uh, potential omission. I know when we went through this, we said we we're going to you know, take a position on this, these issues, but I'm still a little bit buzzy on the things that we discuss going back and forth on, you know, trying to provide other direction for, you know, confirming which committees would be required to do it for legislative or financial, you know, content reasons and then just reinforcing the rules that otherwise uh, decisions about, uh, you know, broad, uh, remote meetings and broadcasting would be, would be at the discretion of the chair. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't see, and you had actually made some suggestions for, for potential changes on that. Uh, to the uh, and I have the quote here, which I'll pull up in a minute. But it was uh... yeah, I think that uh, I think those two issues have, have uh, uh, kind of come together. I think that the I don't think there's a requirement in the hybrid meeting policy to broadcast the meeting. Right. Uh, I think that any sort of uh, remote participation is accepted. I think the issue that we've we've had some discussion on of late is this requirement to broadcast and retain for archival purposes right. recorded proceedings of certain committees. Okay. And so that is a separate issue that I expect we'll bring up through rules and policies and bring forward. Okay. But this is something just simply unique to remote participation of, of committee Fine. members. Fine. Yeah. I just want to make yeah. sure we get it's, 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 it's all happening yeah. at the same time. Otherwise, it's, yeah. yeah. I we connect the to, issues, they may not be yeah. connected in anybody. And we talked about it last night, yeah. or I brought up last night in the council meeting, because yeah. obviously I'd like to see yeah. more rather than less. Yeah. But I think our purpose today is 
to make sure we've got this participation policy yeah. in place so that we're in line with what the state's asking or, or requiring or allowing us to do. Um, and yeah. I think it's, personally, I think it's great because um, it means that if, for example, I'm away on business or whatever, or any of you away on business, but you can still participate remotely, um, which is a huge help, I think, in my opinion. So, um, if there's, yeah. I just had a question for you. I lost my pack. So, but I read oh. it again. I think the only question I had was the fee remote that, within this may have been town council specific. That's why I get very fuzzy with so long. That the chair had to be alerted well in advance. And there wasn't a definition on that time frame. Uh, uh, the, the policy the council passed and the policy that's in front of this committee right now really does not empower the council chair or committee chair to do to have a role in that decision. Yeah. Okay. Maybe um, I read a prior version or something. Yeah. So because that was my only question yeah. was meeting that criteria. You know, that you yeah. Did. And how do you deal with it? You get sick early in the morning. You don't want to come in and share it. How do you do it? Okay, so that's not even in. in no, the it, but but it does articulate the reasons that are valid for right. remote participation, which are illness or for other physical or other physical condition or temporary absence from the jurisdiction where traveling to the meeting would cause the member to face significant right. difficulties to right. attend in person. So it's pretty broad, right? I mean, it, it's fairly broad. Yeah, I mean, and, and I would just. Soon leave it broad. I mean, let's see how it works. Yeah, and, and I just should say the prior sentence to what I just read is committee members in this case or council members uh, are expected to be physically present. So the presumption is that you're here in person. The exception is remote participation, and there's some qualified uh, reasons. I see our town attorney here, and I, I don't want to uh, divert from this, but uh, I've heard rumors that this next le legislative session a number of legislators that sponsored this legislation um, have noticed that it really falls short in a number of respects. So no. it's quite possible, if not likely, that there'll be some further modifications. Oh, sure. um, and maybe when Phil joins later, he can just speak to that. Just it, it's my record. understanding on the state level, because I did discuss this with one of our legislators, um, that th with the emergency ending, they had to do something. Yep. Um, so this was what they came up with. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they had to tweak a few things or, or whatnot. So do we need a motion on this? To yes, accept, please. Yeah. Accept the, uh, yeah. the policy as, as written. Is that a motion? Yes, it is. <laughs> do I have a second? Second. Okay. Can we have a vote, please? Council Johnson? Yes. Council Hammond? Yes. Council Perry? Yes. That is accepted. Thank you. Okay, here we go. 5G. We need a reminder as to where we were and where we are and where we want to go. And it's I've been pretty clear with this. I don't need to relitigate the whole thing. Um, but it does need a little more polishing up. Um, and I, I want to assure Ms. Bristol or others who are concerned that. I have no intention of adopting anything that's strictly coming from the uh, no. the uh, industry. Um, but I was looking through some of my old notes. I have a whole file here on it. On you know what had come up, and Allison, at, excuse me, Ms. Bristol did a really good job of you know delineating what the concerns were of. The folks who spoke at the last time we, we heard this. Uh, and I understand most of them myself. Um, I have some, yeah, some of them are like, mm, well, yeah. but whatever. So, Liam, do you have anything that you can do to? Where do we want to start? I guess. That's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's the big question for the committee, I suppose. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that just to bring everyone else up to speed, this was a conversation that we left off about a year ago. Uh, yeah. And again, it was a draft that received quite a lot of attention from uh, a former counselor and a number of members of the public. Uh, obviously, the, the draft went out for review by uh, some industry 
people. Uh, I think Verizon, most notably, there may be a few others uh, where they made proposed edits to it. Um, obviously, it, it fell off the radar for uh, a variety of, I think, relevant reasons. I think GMO maybe came into play then. Um, so it's really kind of, I think, for, for today's purposes, it's, and again, we do have the benefit of having the town attorney on the line, which we'll bring into the meeting here shortly. Uh, but I think it's uh, revisiting where we left things, uh, where we left the draft, uh, and then trying to set a plan in place for moving forward. Um, how ready do we think this is? I certainly think that uh, it's not, as uh, Councillor Katarina alluded to, it's, it's probably not ready for prime time yet. Um, but I think that maybe just bringing ourselves up to speed and getting a plan in place for moving forward would be the objective. Well, I had a question. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to dial back into this issue, so to speak. Uh, and what's really happened since we dealt with this last in terms of activity? Do we know how many 5G uh, installations there have been and what the total is now that we've had in town? Because I remember last time we had a hard time identifying we were two or three of them, I think, total. Some of them are there. Yeah, so, yeah, so and, it, and Okay. Yeah, so what, what I'd propose to do is bring Jay and Phil into the conversation. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if uh, Jay will have an answer to that, but certainly uh, I'm going to promote both of you to panelists and you can choose to keep your, you know, turn your, your camera on or not. Yeah, as Liam's bringing them in, I do recall one of the challenges that we have is that to the extent that many of these systems uh, go on existing uh, utility poles, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't cause any notification to the town. There's no right. cost, there's no permit required. Right. I think uh, Jay's uh, chimed in in the past that it could be argued that there might be an electrical permit that's required depending yes. on the nature of the work. But I suspect when Jay comes in and speaks, um, we're largely unaware when this work is happening. You've got utility trucks up on the lines. We're not aware of what they're doing. So I had a follow up to that. So would the changes that we're contemplating require that we would monitor that and then be able to track it? Does it it does seem strange yes. to me that we don't have any ability to do that. It seems like it would be a good thing well, to know. Considering my terrible cell coverage. Looking at, looking at <laughs> it simply, because I had a conversation with Jay, I think Jay will back me up. I asked him this the other night. Right? Because we do not have an ordinance, yeah. no one right. needs to come to us. Yeah. Right? And because the ordinance that we've got that was not written by the industry, and I Get offended by that. This was brought forward to us by Jay with a lot of hard work. Yeah, right. We had a review, which we had a lot of industry people review some of our work. Yeah. This is homegrown, it's been modified uh, and adjusted. And look what's happened since our last week. We right. have 5G springing up everywhere because yeah. we have nothing. I, I kind of like to have something so yeah. at least we can track what we've got. We know who's coming. We can't even identify the units. Yeah. that we identify our units, we don't know who they belong to. And that's because we don't have an ordinance. So, you know, we can we can discuss this to the cows come home and, and we'll see what the attorney says. But <laughs> we also have no ability to collect any fees, right? So, right. right. Yeah. That's okay. add to your point. Right. I think it's interesting that um, people don't really know where they are um, or they aren't as aware of it because I know one of the Real major pushbacks was, oh, they're going to be ugly. They're going to, you know, make everything look bad. I will, I will say, and I'm speaking only for myself, that since I've been working on this ordinance, have become aware of it. Every time I go anywhere, I'm looking at poles, <laughs> and it's interesting to see how much stuff is on poles. Make sure you pay attention to the road as well. Please. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I got to do that too. <laughs> But but it, it it's it is amazing and it's not just 5G. There's also this cable stuff. There's this. There's that. There's the other thing. Um. So anyway, so I that's why I get a little like I'm gonna use the word perturbed because you know me I'm honest about it. When people are like, well, it's gonna be like small refrigerators and blah 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 blah, blah, blah. and it's like. Yeah, there's all sorts of stuff on the polls too. But that being said, um, it is interesting. Most people I don't think know. I happen to know where some of them are just because my cell phone pops up with 5G on it. And I'm like, yes. So I know I sound biased. Go ahead. So, uh, Jay, I don't know if you have a, any anecdotal response to uh, Councillor Hamill's initial question about what we've seen for activity or prevalence since we last picked up this conversation. And then I think from there, 
perhaps Phil, if you could give a, a overview of what you're seeing in other municipalities and, and where you understood kind of us to be at with a draft format. I know you, you did provide some uh, guidance to us about a year ago on some other concerns raised from a, uh, another attorney. Um, but Jay, I don't know if you want to start with that. Yeah, sure. And I think, Tom, you gave a great answer, right? As you drive around town, there's always trucks out in the right of way with, with uh, someone up in the cherry picker, and it's hard to know what they're putting up there. I, you know, I, I do try to sometimes as I'm driving around, look up and see what's going on. And frankly, sometimes what I think might be a 5G, I, I just, I can't tell. So um, that, that's more anecdotal. Um, in terms of right now, since we don't have permitting, um, obviously we don't have the numbers. We had, ha, we have in a few instances had opportunity when folks have come in and actually pulled an electric permit to put them up. I haven't, that was, um, it's been months, six, nine months or more since I've heard of of one of those type of permits being pulled doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I can certainly check on that. I did not think to do that before this meeting, but um, you know, I think that's, that's the exception rather than the rule, quite frankly, um, when these are being installed, how many are around town? I, I really frankly don't know, um, but it, it's really not been an issue that's um, been prevalent in, in, um, in any conversations that we've had in this department with regards to, you know, concerns one way uh, or the other, frankly, um, on the installations. Just, just as an aside before Phil jumps in, um, we've been contacted by a firm out of uh, Massachusetts, I believe, that is interested in doing a, a cell coverage survey of our community. And I think they're mm -hmm. doing it in many communities. And there's clearly business purposes behind this. Uh, but they are kind of have inquired about our willingness to assist with them in terms of getting the, the word out that they're interested in collecting this information. I'm inclined to actually participate with them so we can actually mm -hmm. start to get some data. Mm -hmm. We all have yeah. our own experiences, yeah. and, but it would be great to have, you know, a, yeah. a more scientific, uh, deliberate approach that would actually show us where uh, bridges is, is good and where it's lacking. So, Because I know anecdotally, um, other people in my business we're on, we live on our farms, um, and everyone's always saying, oh, Scarborough, go ahead. We can't keep these so covered in Scarborough. And just also, um, that neighborhood app, that whatever it's called. I mean, Next door. Thank you. Gotcha. Next door app. Occasionally things will pop up. Um, and I noticed that there were a couple of people from the Ash Swamp area who posted last week about how concerned they were because they had no cell coverage. They were newer. Mm -hmm. to town um and i know we've talked about this before with the towers and whatever that you know for uh younger people they don't even know a landline was and it hit them in the face you know they're moving into town and they don't have cell coverage and it's a public it's potential public safety issue also but again it's part of a broader broader issue so yeah i would encourage a survey yeah. down. Well. so phil um, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm not actually familiar with a lot of other ordinances at this time. Um, there could have been some documents since a year ago. I think, yeah, I was looking back at this when I was asked to join uh, for another topic tonight, and then this was going to be on there. So it was about a year ago. I wrote a letter, and you guys were working on it over the last, you know, 2020. In fact, I got the question. Uh, to date it and we got the question. Then all of a sudden, every the world shut down. So it was actually started back in March and April. Um, but there has been a lot of comments on this from attorneys from different, uh, I would just note uh, to get back to your earlier conversation from, from different perspectives. So you had attorneys for the industry, but also attorneys for people who are concerned about 5G. And that's actually the letter I was responding to in my letter. Um, so th there's been a number of different um, constituencies who have weighed in. At, at its essence, um, uh, what happened, and I'm not going to go through my entire letter or the law, but just to remind people is that the legislature did pass a law a couple of years ago that essentially preempted municipal regulation as it relates to um, small cell technology. The idea being, or that what, what's called small wireless facilities, the idea being, at least in the view of the legislature, it, it was a policy goal of the legislature to expand coverage of uh, cell coverage um, and uh, to essentially make it easier for this type of facility to go up. 
that that's that's what the legislature did. So what it said, however, is that we can have some reasonable regulations around that, but we have to they have to be permitted in every single zone in town. We can't exclude them. And so there's sort of two, I think, immediate sort of issues and why Jay started working on this. One is your ordinance is um, likely um, uh, inconsistent. And I say likely because it doesn't really deal with that term, but you do have a term called uh, telecommunications facilities, which would probably wrap up um, these kind of facilities and, they're only, and those are only allowed in certain zones. So that's already inconsistent. These small wireless have to be allowed in every single zone. The, and the second is um, sort of what Jay mentioned, which is um, with that said, you don't really have a, an, a, a permitting mechanism in place, a review mechanism in place for these types of facilities. So this ordinance would, would allow you to do that, to at least have some review. Um, you are limited in what you can do and the industry has been very clear and, and many times they've been right with um, uh, about what we can and cannot do. Um, and part, not only is it this statute, but there's also certain federal statutes we have to be aware of. There's the Federal Telecommunications Act, which also limits municipalities in many different ways. Um, again, policy decision from the Congress in that case. Um, so, but we can still do certain things. And so that's what the goal of this ordinance has been, which is to allow the town to have sufficient um, ordinances to be able to review these within the, within the confines of the limitations that have been put on us. And it may still need, you know, another review of all the stakeholders, every stakeholder, the public, the industry, everything. Again, it's been about a year. So it is worth sort of cleaning it up, as you mentioned, um, Jean Marie, and uh, because there are some, com the last draft I saw still has some comments in it, some deletions. So uh, maybe cleaning it up, getting another draft out there and circulating it for, for review, and then we can respond to that. Yeah, I think, Phil, if I could, thank you. Uh, I just want to do make mention that the, the draft that was provided as part of the packet sort of references that it's the 915 town draft and the strike throughs and underlines that are being seen are what were provided by industry. So, okay, um, thank you. That, that's so those. So, if you were to reinsert all the strike throughs and take out all the underlines, that's what the town had had um, proposed. And certainly, you know, there was still discussion to be had. Um, so, for what it's worth, um, just to sort of remind folks of what that where we were, where yeah. we were. Yep. And if I question, um, because it's come up and that's our sign ordinance prevents placement of signs in these so-called visual impact areas or visually important areas. Can you ban these, the 5G in those areas under the way the legislatures construe this? I'll, I'll yeah, answer. Not in my, yeah, <laughs> I'll yeah, answer not, first, not, and then I'll let Phil Okay, correct. you go first. Yeah, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> so, so our our draft, that nine fifteen draft that you'll see, I think it's in. I can't remember what section. I just had it up. Did have we as a policy? The ordinance committee was heading down that direction, and that was language that was in the town draft. Was really picking up on those same designated areas. Um, as were listed in the sign ordinance, and I and um, and so we really sort of felt that by by defining them more clearly, as I recall, it gave us sort of that um, uh, sort of standing to make to to make that determination because we were you know we we had for a specific reason identified specific areas, didn't just sort of leave it vague as sort of these scenic vistas, which are undefined. We really clearly defined from this spot on the road to this spot on a road and then other sections. Um, and that was one that, as you see, the industry had had sought to, to strike out. And then, so that's, that's sort of the update as to where we were. And then Phil will tell us if we were right in <laughs> where we were headed. Yeah, so at least under my review of the statute is this would not be allowed. We, we, we really, what the legislature essentially said was, why, well, not essentially, what it specifically says is a small wireless facility must be, permit, must be a permitted use within the public right of way, subject yeah. to permitting requirements and certain conditions. So that's a use determination. And the legislature essentially said these are allowed everywhere in the public way. That's, that's I, think those, I think that's the straight reading of that statute. 
So they're allowed everywhere, but they're, oh, they're right I, in the right way. But there still is an allowance for the town to make restrictions as they relate to aesthetics and uh, style and that sort of thing. I understand, even though those things may not be included in uh, visual impact areas. Is that right? Yes, that well, that's right. As long as those kind of restrictions are would be generally applicable to other what, other permitted uses in the district. So, in other words, you can't you can't have them apply just a small cell. They can't call them out, if you will. It has to be of general applicability. And Phil, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly, that it's your view that the law requires that they be allowed anywhere within the public right of way? Yes. That's different than allowing them in all zones. Yeah, just it says must be a permitted use within the public right of way. So it's not it's actually not technically a zoning requirement. It's a public it, it just applies in the public right of ways throughout throughout the community. And so this ordinance that we were drafting, Tom, was just uh, just regulating within the right of way. It was it was sort of zone silent, if you will. We said, OK, everywhere there's a public right of way. This is how we're going to treat. Um, and, and license these activities. Um, That's right. Because if it's and outside the right of way, it would then be picked up by the other ordinance that Phil was referencing, our telecommunications, I think it was called, um, provisions. And then there's a, a whole host of other review criteria that someone needs to go through, Board of Appeals and all that. And, if they can meet all those criteria and thresholds, they could happen outside the right of way, but it's really within the right of way. We, we can't say where and where they can't go, just, we, but we can create this licensing and procedure. That's right. Okay. That, that, I mean, that makes sense to me. This is all coming back to me now, um, as, far as, as far as that. So this ordinance, again, just the thing that's tuning in, this ordinance, is just for the right of way and to bring us into line with um, the state statute. Because I know our cell, I'm remember, if I'm remembering our cell phone ordinance, because I was one that brought it up as part of the, when we were negotiating, whatever, three, four years ago on cell towers, um, I put in something to do with uh, wires on poles or antenna or poles or something in residential neighborhoods. And uh, Representative Piazzo called me as soon as this legislative, legislative act was passed to say, guess what, Counselor? Scarborough's in violation by having that in that particular ordinance. So that's how I first got clued into um, what's going on here. Uh, I need some guidance from people on what's our next steps then. I mean, I, and, and I do want to say I agree that, thank you, um, Ken, for saying this wasn't written by the industry. The industry commented on it. It was written by Jay, and he did a great job with it. Knowing, you know, that people were going to weigh in on, on what they thought, you know, changes uh, were needed. Um, the reason I asked about this, you know, that scenic vista, whatever, was, you know, if it were allowed, I could see maybe doing that, but obviously it's not something that's allowed uh, for us to, to be regulating. Um, so where do we go from here? I'm looking at the two gentlemen here yeah. across from me. Yeah, I, I was just rereading the um, Phil's response to the the other attorney, uh, one of the questions he raised that Phil responded to had to do with bonding or insurance. Oh, right. So in the event of insurance, abandonment, insurance. I think yeah. section eight of the draft ordinance, you know, kind of speaks to the removal, relocation, or modification of the facilities and kind of notice requirements. But the notion of having some sort of guarantee that uh, after abandonment, the facility would be dismantled and removed, um, we just did this with utility scale solar. Right. Uh, I think we have a similar provision in the yeah. telecommunications tower ordinance as well. Phil, is that something that could be added? Yes, uh, yeah, and again, I just have that caveat as long as it's not targeted just to small cells. So we'd have to write it in a way, not a door for Jay, that 
you know, for all types of equipment in the light, uh, right of way, maybe. Um, we would have to just make sure it's the, the statute is the term. It cannot be non-discriminatory, meaning can't target these types of uses. So if we write in a way that just, you know, for any kind of facility in the right of way, requiring some sort of bonding, something like that. Uh, and if, uh, trying to administer, I, I guess I just caution us a little bit about trying to administer, because I think, Phil, as you and I have talked, I think that you may be even saying that at least the way I'm understanding some of our past conversations, that may now even be applying to all telephone poles. Yeah. Right. And so we, I guess I just caution us about thinking about how many surety bonds we want to be holding, how many telephone poles are there in town. And how right. are we going to track and actually administer that? Um, I caution us against yeah. <laughs> going down a rabbit hole and having to hire a whole new department of uh, <laughs> right away facility assurities. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a suggestion. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, as Phil said, it's been a while. So this is going to be. Yeah. Back up. We have to not do a restart, but right. you know, we have to get back up. So I, I suggest we clean up what we've got because, again, it, I read this before the meeting. Yeah. I remember it. Jay did do a great job. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's real close. Uh, I would like to look at the Lewis mission from Allison just for to, to become more informed. Maybe it's something that we can fit in. Have it uh, cleaned up a little bit. And a once over one more time with Phil, and then brought into the public with a with a goal to get it to the town council. Because again, when you have no ordinance, yeah. they're being popped up. It's better to have a, a unperfect ordinance. We can at least track and identify folks that are in town than have nothing. Every passing month, right? That's where we are. So yeah. that's what I'm suggesting. Yeah, I would second that with uh, the main point I want to make sure we underscore is adding in language that is not in there currently that deals with the uh, with the issues that Allison Bristol referenced, which go back to a Ben Smith uh, uh, letter and it also included input from Eliza Boxer or Betsy Weisman. You know, those refer to the ability for neighborhoods to address issues that deal with aesthetics and the other factors that you mentioned. So we do not currently have language that effect in this draft. But we have to be careful with that because you Understood. can't do that. Well, but but Phil addressed that question earlier. We said that as long as you, it applies throughout and it's not discriminatory in terms of types of telecommunications equipment, that should be okay. Well, I think that you're right, opening Phil? a Pandora's box. Well, I don't, I just think we had a big segment of the public for to whom this is very important, and it's just not including that or not addressing it. I think would, would not be fair. Well, I would ask. I would ask that uh, Mr. Saucier uh, look at that. It, uh, Phil, okay. I knew it all the spot here, but uh, just yeah, because this whole aesthetic thing. Because I remember they were talking about well, it can't be close to an X amount of feet to a house. Blah blah. blah. Yeah, I don't recall. Do that. we do that with cable? Do we do that with you know anything else? Street lights, right. telephone. Because exactly. that's the whole thing with exactly. the state statute. The you, state statute saying you're not doing that with anyone else. You can't do it with 5G. In fact, you make physical connection with electricity and phone and others to, to the homes. Right. Right. That'll work. So anyway, so Phil, if you wouldn't mind I could follow up on that. Yeah, for sure. That is that sticking point. People that... raised issues, but we never got down to the point of actually seeing any language on it. So, you know, so I, and I understand the statutes do not prevent that from being done. We just said we didn't get far enough along to have anybody drown. It does prevent it. It has to be, it can't be discriminatory. We understand that, but that provided it is not discriminatory, but it allows, you know, uh, certain areas to be exempted following a certain process that, you know, for visual impact and other reasons that were allowed, uh, it's hostile. I thought Phil You'd have to do it with there. everything, right? not just 5G. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just don't see how we move through this, uh, you know, relying primarily on input from, you know, from revised. The only set of revisions that I saw actually came from, you know, the uh, the telcos. We reworked a lot of that. But that notwithstanding, I don't think we're really going to 
complete our work if we don't somehow get to an answer on that? And if the answer is no, right. it's, it's not possible from a legal standpoint, okay. Right. But I don't I don't feel as though that's been answered based upon what I've That's why I've asked that. Phil to, to look at that for us. Thank and you. if we do yeah. this, then, yeah. then the way I understand the statute is we have to do it for everybody. Yeah, I just Cable, want, yeah. telephone, Light. I, just, on I think we left it in midair and, and, and there was a lot of energy around it and I don't think we would be I wouldn't feel comfortable that we had considered everything that was brought forward to that point when uh, the lights went out or the phone went down the 5G my cell phone down no. <laughs> right. did you have something to add? yeah I, I did just want to, to make reference I, or just be sure I understand um, so with the previous town version under section six, we did have provisions around where the couldn't be located was actually in the language. And that was what the industry folks had suggested to strike through. And so Don, uh, in, during your discussion, I just want to be sure I'm understanding, are, is that the type of provision that you're concerned you haven't seen language for or that isn't currently in the draft? Is that really what you're talking about? Is the scenic vista piece or is there? There were the points that Allison articulated. I don't think you joined when she was speaking, Jay. So, but she did it earlier in the meeting and there were various versions, but I don't think uh, contract language that was proposed to after that. Oops. So, and I, I refer me to the part that- Yeah, it's section six. Yep, we'll, we'll take a look at it. I think I'm understanding the. No, I mean we actually. Yeah. There is a section right. and, and, so, and everything. I mean, Don, what's confusing? It, it's this language here, which we included. Right. It's, it's the industry input is to delete that, and that's that's those specific scenic vistas. Scenic right. vistas. And Phil's saying that we can't have those scenic vistas. Is that what you said, Phil? Yeah. That's, yeah. I, what I had said is my initial reaction is we wouldn't be able to prohibit uh, small cell in specific areas around town. Yes. Not it's it, the statutes. I mean, at least my reading is it's a pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward language. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of ambiguity in it. It's a, they they must be a permitted use in all public right of ways throughout town. Throughout, throughout the, uh, each community. And the nuance Same. being that if we were to identify these type of limit the, or these locational limitations, then we'd have to identify these locational limitations to all facilities within the right of way, because then we'd be treating all facilities equally. That, and why? Just because we're adding new equipment and we back in the, and then if we were oh. being non discriminatory and in the protecting the visual aspects of these areas, why would that be so, a problem if it went back retroactively and applied uniformly to oh, five and everything else? So they'd have to remove existing utility poles and all facilities on them. Well, would they? Right. But, but Phil, I think, uh, I think what I heard you say is that the, the law is very, very clear in this regard. Uh, it's not the uh, non-discrimination piece. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that these facilities must be allowed anywhere within the right of way. Yes, that's the way I read it. So what we're allowed, so what we're allowed to do is adopt um, non-discriminatory conditions and permitting requirements. So that's a little different than saying that they're not allowed uses in certain areas, right? So we can have some of the kinds of performance standards that are in this ordinance that we're trying to do. Maybe we can add a few more based on this discussion, but that's that's the distinction between regulation around the U and then where they're located. So if anyone raised any health issues or if anybody raised Ooh. any of these other issues that were that were articulated earlier in the meeting, those are we're sorry, but we just can't consider any of those based upon. Yeah, that's right. Health, health is a completely different issue that's prohibited to be raised under the Federal Telecommunications Act. And they cannot and health cannot be a consideration in municipal permitting as it relates to telecommunications facilities generally. So and, we've, and there are some discussions I've had with Jay over the years, and I could pull that discussion without reinventing the wheel four or five years ago when we were, we were developing the telecommunications provisions in, this, in the zoning ordinance. So your question is, how does Lewiston have it in theirs? Yeah. Right? 
So they're right. uh, we'd have to look and see what they have to say. Yeah. And not be discussing right away, public right away telecommunication. Then maybe may something we could examine. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. It still doesn't sound right to me, you know, from the standpoint of principle. But it's, uh, it's, it's the fence of the I state. Need, you know, um, I recall that the, when we left this, it was still open and it hadn't been resolved, and it was not uh, as clear as apparently it is now. I don't know how much the law has changed. Law hasn't changed since then. So maybe. Well, we yeah. Well, let me let me go back. It has been a year since we've discussed this. I'll just. I'll sort of update what I've done before and make sure there hasn't been anything that's changed in the interim on that and I can follow up. I did find while we were talking, um, I had actually replied to a couple of these comments I've actually responded to already. I may need to go into a little more depth based on this, this meeting, but I found an email back in, on June 1 and that were actually in response to counselor, former counselor Glaystein's comments. And she had some questions about um, aesthetics and others that I'd sent to staff. So I'll forward that, I'll update it based on some of the conversation comments I'm having, I'm hearing today and make sure that there, nothing has changed or my views haven't changed, you know, my analysis hasn't changed. Um, and then get back to you. Yeah. Okay. I... Uh, brain trust over here is one of the things too. Right, we need more. We can at least do a clean up here. So we're all stretched so we're looking at something that's fresh in front of us. Yeah. I'm going to say that it's got to go back to staff for that. Would you like us to bring the draft, this draft back, but without all the suggested edits? So kind of where we left it in. Black and white. And then if we could get that together with some memo and something writing from Phil saying that this is, you know, why you can't do this or that or the other thing. Uh, right. And what you're really good at doing, but could, um, make sure you quote the law, you know, give us the, the uh, citations on that because I get that a lot. Well, uh, let's just cite on that. I'm like, how do I know? I'm not a lawyer. But you could put it in. Sure. There. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That sound good, guys? Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're on the right track there. Uh, so I'm going to say if we could get this for October. Right. October, whatever that date is. Do we, uh, Tracy, do you recall what we had on the agenda for October? Not that this isn't going to push it. We have three. The neighbor fireworks and parks. Play agenda. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just reading the notes. Yeah. Sorry, meeting, Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> so, the chair is going to make it October 21st. Okay, that'll be the date that we, we want. We're, that's our next meeting. And so we'll have stuff back to us. Staff will have something cleaned up. Um, and I will. Be talking to Mr. Holland, Mr. Gallagher, about you know where we're at, what's going on with that. Okay. All right. And then what would we have? Fireworks. And stuff. We'll, we'll worry about that later. Fireworks, dogs on beaches. What else did you want? Dogs on beaches. No. Oh, oh please. <laughs> Drones, balls, and scooters. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so are we? Are we good? We're good. Now we go to manufactured housing, which is why Phil was invited. And I can't wait to hear what Phil's got to say. <laughs> All right, Ken, I think you were the one who was asked to bring this forward by. Yes, we, we recall we received a, an email yes. uh, suggesting that we, strongly suggesting that we review the ordinance 500. Uh, I think it's called trailer homes or trailers and trailer homes. And, and just a little side thing. Two days ago, I was Netflixing uh, Fu Man Luke <laughs> while I was reading this ordinance. And I thought it was a parallel universe because that's about the time frame this ordinance was written. Anyway. <laughs> oh. 
Right. Actually, this Ooh. was written in 1944, right. so <laughs> the original writing of it. <laughs> So the request was for us to uh, definitely review it. And okay. Make, probably bring it into the 21st century. All right. That being said, Mr. Sauce here. Um, yeah, thank you. I've been actually, I've spoken about mobile home and, um, and manufactured housing a number of times with, with Jay and staff because it comes up um, from time to time because uh, somewhat similar to the last topic we were talking about, there is a state statute on manu regulation of manufactured housing that does preempt, again, uh, municipal regulation in certain areas as it relates to manufactured housing. It's defined in a very specific way. Um, there are two types of manufactured housing under state law. One is types of units that are considered uh, newer mobile homes, they call them, um, constructed after 1976. And then there's a type called modular homes. They both come in on either their own chassis or independent chassis as they, as the uh, statute says. And what it, and what the statute essentially does is essentially it's a non-discrimination statute for this, this type of housing. Um, there's a manufactured housing board at the state level. So for example, they're actually exempt from building code because they're already reviewed by the state, by the state. But also as it relates to zoning, there's certain restrictions. We, we, have to essentially, we have to allow any modular home that meets the state construction standards to be allowed and all other zones where single family uses are allowed. Um, so in other words, you can't prohibit mobile homes. And if it says single family home, that means mobile home or what we think of as a house um, you, you, anywhere in, in the community. <clears throat> um, also certain restrictions on the, the width of a property. So that really gets to the idea of you can't have um, sort of zone trailers, if you will, out of existence by saying they have to be so wide, you know, a lot so wide. When, when you think of a, a mobile home park, for example, the quote unquote lots are somewhat narrow um, and we can't make them any less narrow than uh, 14 feet wide. <laughs> and we, and we, we can't also make mobile home park lots um, uh, any smaller than, than the ordinance allows us to make it. So there are these sort of requirements. It also came up, and before I get into the chapter 500, um, it's also come up, and um, Jay and I have spoken about this, and in fact, it's, this is an issue that's been around quite some time. My, my um, mentor and predecessor town attorney, um, Chris Bandiotis, had a letter from 1990 that I was that I was asked a question a couple of years ago, and it was the same issue from 1990. So it didn't take me very much very long. But there are some inconsistencies in the in the in the zoning ordinance as it relates to this state statute, specifically about some of those size standards as it relates to um, mobile home parks. But the issue that's come up a couple of times more recently is expansions of mobile home parks, and the reason why is because that the state law says you have to allow mobile home parks, as that term is defined somewhere in your community. You can't zone them out of your, your community. They have to be allowed somewhere. And um, it also goes on to say, so, and reasonably, you should reasonably um, allow them to expand in certain locations, in their existing locations. And there was a law court case that, that actually dealt with a, an ordinance down in Wells that would have essentially prohibited them every, anywhere because it said you couldn't expand the existing parks. They were only allowed where they were allowed, but they couldn't expand. And the law court found out in violation of the statute because the statute says, again, um, you can, uh, municipalities must allow the reasonable, reasonable consideration of expansion of mobile heart parks. Right now, you in, in, in Scarborough, you have a couple of areas where mobile home parks are not allowed, but they exist. So you have legally non-conforming uses, but you have a provision that says um, legally non-conforming uses cannot be expanded. So that's in direct um, contra you know, contradiction to the state statute as it relates to mobile home parks. The staff is aware of that. We, you know, that's something we can maybe work on as, as a potential amendment as you look at chapter 500. But I just wanted to bring that up. There are a couple existing issues with your zoning ordinance as, uh, itself. Okay. Chapter 500 is, yeah, sorry, I'll stop there for a second. Yeah. Um, what's the state statute? What's, where would I find that? Sure, that's in title 30A, the municipal statute. Um, okay. Section 4358. Okay, thanks. It's under the sub chapter dealing with all the land use regulation statutes. Okay. Bill actually sent so, us yeah. from the, what, the MMA planning board manual. We can yeah, I thought that might be helpful. 
Yeah. Kind of a bridge version of, of yeah, the statue. Yeah, I see that, yeah. Sort of in that sort of classic MMA way of um, very easy to, to understand and just boil down to a page and a half, essentially, of how, this, how these are regulated. There's obviously a lot more nuance to this, but it's a good primer on the topic. Okay. I'll forward that provision. It's just a, a page long. Yeah, that would be helpful for me. Um, so chapter 500 is an interesting one. I had never really had the opportunity to look at it up until a day or two ago when Jay asked me <laughs> to potentially <laughs> participate. Um, it obviously uses certain outdated term terminology um, that we wouldn't use today. Um, trailer camp being one. Um, or, or house car trailer, which is a term of art that yeah, I don't know if that is something that from, was from the 60s uh, or, or, you know, but that's what it that's what it's called in that ordinance. So that's not a term anymore. Um, it, you know, the state statute does allow us to regulate certain mobile homes prior to when the state essentially stepped in and started regulating them. So it's in the statute and it's, uh, let me just get the exact 1976, I want to say. Yeah. June 15th, 1976. So to the extent there's anything like that, even standing um, or, or around, you know, it basically it allowed us to make sure that they are habitable and safe for people to stay in. So we still have a little bit of leeway as it relates to these older units that were never regulated by the state. Um, so I think this gets to some of that, but I do agree with the counselor that this is outdated. Um, it, it, it had a, it, I, just like most ordinances had a purpose at the time, and I was talking to Jay and there were likely some areas of town and some structures in town that were potentially unsafe for human habitation. It's just the town's, you know, way of trying to regulate it. But you, but you would want to go through this and, and make sure if, there's any, if it's not necessary anymore, you can, you should delete it. There's no reason to keep, you know, uh, ordinance. My view is always, you should no reason to keep ordinance on the view uh, books anymore if they're not necessary um, or if they've been superseded by other, you know, other regulations. Well, is this so antiquated, it will be nearly impossible to amend, to modernize? Is it a kind of a repeal and replace? I think so. I mean, honestly, I think so. And you, and you may be able to simply deal with it, some of it, um, with some of your existing ordinances, either zoning or, you know, some health, there's some health statutes out, you know, now that we, the health officer can use for some of these purposes, like looking at the rubbish in this, you know, um, safety requirements, sanitary requirements. You know, some of those are already dealt with with other regulations. And I think um, there, there may be ways if there are some of the performance standards that are in there to fold those into the zoning ordinance, if there are some things that that's you right. still want to regulate and it, you're sort of putting everything together. Because as Phil mentioned, we've had this conversation over my now, you know, you know, probably 10 years or so about sort of recognizing we have this inconsistency with our zoning ordinance and even dating back to that memo from 1990 for, you know, uh, between one of the town's earlier planning directors and Phil's predecessor identifying the same issue. We've often thought about this in the chapter, you know, in the zoning ordinance world and less so about this chapter 500 that's really sort of brought the issue to the fore. But I think this is a good opportunity for the town to really sort of take on both issues, really get our hands around it. And because there, there is inconsistencies and um, frankly, just sort of odd verbiage in our zoning ordinance around this as well. So, um, you know, it, it was, I think it's timely for the town to, to take a look at this and, and hear what, what sort of the interest of the ordinance committee is before we start to, you know, pull something together in the next few months for, for you all to think further about. I thought the preamble to it was kind of 1944-ish sounding. Yeah. Their, their safety, spread of contagious diseases, morals, comfort, you know, it's like, good Lord. <laughs> Cool right. And, and, you know, for example, like the water provisions, um, sanitary provisions required drinking water as meeting the requirements of the United States Pub Public Health Service. Well, they don't really, you know, now it's the Department of Health and Human Services, wastewater and uh, public health drinking water requirements. So it's a different body even really that would regulate that. Um, yeah. Tom, do you know, uh, 
when I read the when I read this ordinance, because it, it seemed to me it, it tried to do too much in one order, try to regulate. I'd like to call them communities, not parks. But to try to regulate the community and the contents of the community in the same ordinance. And it got real messy to me. Do, do folks that live in one of these communities have to submit the names and addresses of their residents? I believe the the uh, the park owner does that for them. There's an annual licensure process and, and requirement. Mm -hmm. So this comes up annually uh, as a burr under their saddle. I was just looking at a letter that State Manufactured Homes sent back in March of 2020 that spoke of this kind of annual reminder of the how antiquated and discriminatory this order right. is. So yeah, I, mean, I don't disagree. Correct. I mean, that is something that we wouldn't have to accommodate somewhere else because it is sounds very discriminatory. Everybody gets a tax bill. We know who where everybody lives. Yeah. And again, it gets back to the I think the original tent when this was written was which was not a pretty time. You know, right. Tell me who's living that's right in your camp. Right. And uh, yeah, it just brings yeah, yeah, I don't know whether there's a valid reason for these being licensed annually. Uh, you know, I, I guess I would want to give that more thought. What, right. why they're any different than in, any other? Any other? Well, well I think it's treated like cars. We're, we're entitled, you know, we charge excise fees because technically manufactured housing, and I'm talking strictly from a real estate point of view. It's not real estate. They depreciate over time. But but this the license fee is a is a standard flat fee that apply to all, so it, it okay. doesn't vary depending on the value of the unit or anything, to my knowledge. Is it in, in addition to some other fee that we're yeah. charging? To, personal property, right? It gets they get charged personal property. Am I remembering that correctly? Well, there there are real estate taxes levied. Yes, uh, I don't know if it's personal property. Uh, yeah. It's the value of the structure. Yeah. Okay. The land is valued differently and paid. Right. Uh, the land the is owned by the whoever owns the correct. So the town of White has a manufactured home ordinance that's actually quite well written. Hmm. Uh, I sent a copy to. Uh, I actually think maybe we should take a look at that and, and like uh, Nick and Phil said, some of these things other take care of zoning. So um, yeah, would you would you be amenable to staff working with legal? Council to come up with kind of a comprehensive approach that would address the inconsistencies in the zoning ordinance right. and address uh, you know, chapter 500 at the same time. Yeah, I will. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think that's okay. the one. Bill, you must have other municipal clients that you could draw from. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely could. Yes. White fields as well. Yeah. Okay, I will. Yeah. Yeah. So we we'll wait for them to get back to us. Um, okay. Great. All right. Anything else that I'm forgetting? Do you want to just touch base on what's on your next agenda? I think, Don, you had listed off three items. That was from a note that I had, but I didn't want. Yeah. I don't well, you did it. prioritize, I think, for yeah, we did. the fall. I don't have it right well, in front of me. We prioritized the items, but not necessarily the order of the. I thought we did. We, I think you did. We, we put dates, but I don't have it right. For, I didn't yeah, bring my whole file. Like Spotify. Where is the good, good neighbor ordinance yeah. and fireworks? Okay, I'm sorry. Right. What is it? Good neighbor yeah. ordinance and fireworks. And 5G. It seems like. And 5G. Yeah. So we could push. We could push back another month and just yeah. do the 5G next month. I'm looking yeah. at my neighbors. <laughs> no, I agree. I think 5G because yeah. it's a complete refresh. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. So, sounds good. So, we'll do 5G in October, October 21st, and we'll push back the good neighbor ordinance and fireworks. I'm not going to give a date certain in November because with the election, there may be a different ordinance chair. I don't know what's going to happen. And they may want a different day of the week, but. There you go. Let's focus on the 21st. Let's and take focus it from there. on October. Yeah, and get this 5G. Yeah. Okay. All right. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Great. Oh, sorry. Did I hear someone? Oh. No, I would just say great. Thank you for having me. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Phil. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Don't get in the way of adjournment, Phil. <laughs> Second. Oh.
All in favor? Council Johnson? Yes. Council Himmel? Yes. Council Katarina? Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thanks a lot. Good meeting. Thank you. Thank you.